You are now tuned into the network, the YouTube channel that takes complex networking topics and dumbs them down to a more simpler language. Today's topic is describe IPv6 NAT, NAT64, and NPT versus 6. This is a topic in the CCMP route exam. It will be known as CCMP Enterprise in the future, February 24th, 2020 to be exact. Let's go ahead and take a look at the exam blueprint, see where we came from, where we're headed. Hashtag lab every day. Also visit laboreveryday.com and please go ahead and hit that like button and please subscribe to my channel. Please subscribe to my channel. All right, this is the exam blueprint implementing Cisco IP routing, exam code 300-101. It will be exam code 300-401. We just wrapped up the section, static NAT, dynamic NAT, and PAT, or port address translation. Today, again, we're going to be doing IPv6 NAT, and then we're going to describe SLA architecture. So what is IPv6 NAT? It's, it is exactly what it is. It's NAT. For IPv6, and if you don't know what NAT is, NAT is Network Address Translation. What is that? That's when we need to translate public or private IP addresses to public IP addresses because private IP addresses are not routable on the internet. And also, we pretty much ran out of IP addressing, and this is the reason why we have public to private IP addressing, right? So that's what NAT is, right? What is IPv6 NAT? It's basically the IP, IPv6 version of NAT. Well, what is IPv6? IPv6 is the newer implementation of IPv4, right? They skipped five because I guess it didn't work. I can't remember what the reason why, but anyways, uh, we ran out of IP addresses in, in, with IPv4. We had like 4.2 million or something like that. So they came up with a new implementation and that was IPv6. And that got like, um, I can't even remember. It's, it's, a, it's a really big number. Something septillion. I'll, I'll figure out what that word is and I'll put it in the notes below. But anyways, it's, it's a lot of addresses. What is NAT64? Well, we came to talk about, right? NAT64 is basically, just like what I said, it's the IPv6 implementation of NAT. So when we need to translate IPv4 or an IPv6 network and we need to talk to an IPv4 for device when I people or vice versa, right? This is where NAT64 will come in, right? So you, you can have an IPv6 network, which most likely won't. Well, you'll probably have an IPv4 network and you need to contact a IPv6 host. NAT64 will help with that because it will translate the IPv4, you know, uh, network or addressing scheme to an IPv6. Um, it will allow you to talk from IPv4 to IPv6 and vice versa. Simply put, let's head over to slides for the official definition. All right, NAT64 is the successor to NATPT. What's NATPT? As you see in the asterisk at the bottom right there, Network Address Translation Protocol Translation. It was basically the first version of NAT64, when the first version of it, it was a mechanism for us to translate, you know, allow IPv6 devices or hosts to talk to an IPv4 device or host or vice versa and enables translation between IPv6 addresses and IPv4 addresses. This can be done with either stateless and stateful NAT64, and we'll discuss the difference between the two in the next uh, couple slides. You look at this topology right here at the bottom. Shout out to, I think it's spyrant.com. That's where I got this image from. They also have a, a, uh, a tutorial on this as well. So let's say we've got this client right here that speaks in only IPv6, right? It has an IPv6 address, and it needs to contact this IPv4 only application server. Well, how is it going to do it? Well, we have this router that that is capable of NAT64. So it's capable of translating IPv6 packets to allow you to speak to an IPv4 host, right? Or vice versa. So we got this client that will most likely need, let's say he puts in, in this example, allen.com. If he types in allen.com, he's going to query the DNS server to find out what the IPv4 address is, right? Because all we know is the is the is the name. So we put in Allen.com, right? Now that's the thing. When we talk about DNS or when we talk about when we talk about NAT64, we need to also talk about DNS64. I know it's not in the uh, exam description or a bullet point there, but we need to talk about DNS64. It's basically the IPv6 version of DNS. If you know what a DNS server is, a DNS server maps IP addresses to host names, like kind of like google.coms is 8.8.8. .8 That's the IP address, right? For it, 8.8.8.8. That's just an example, an exam, prime example, right? Now, it'll query the DNS server. The DNS server is going to tell you, I'm going to show you guys exactly 
what it really does. But let's just say he queries the DNS server and he finally gets the IP addressing for it. Then he put he, he goes to the uh, internet and tries to access the application server using the um, IPv6 address, which which he will have obtained, right? So well, he's obtained it, gets to Allen.com. Allen.com is going to that is that is the IPv4 address, right? But we were as a, was able to get the IPv6 address through the DNS server and then go through the NAT64 device to get to this IPv4 application server. Now, here's the thing: an IPv6 client uses what's known as a well-known prefix to get out to the internet. It uses this address right here. We may need to uh, we may need to memorize this address right here because I realized that you know as, as I was doing some research on this I ran into this a lot so 64 right colon ff9b that is the well-known prefix that we use um with nat 64 right 64 ff b colon colon and then whatever the IP address for the site is so in this case that's the prefix right and then the website is the IPv4 address 112.123. So we're going to use this to contact the IPv4 um, application server. That's going to be the full address. But this red part right here is the well-known prefix that we're going to use to contact an IPv4 host when we are an IPv6 client, right? So remember that. Uh, remember that prefix. That may come up on the exam right there. This next slide, it, now remember when I said when we query a DNS64 server, it don't just like, okay, what's, hey, what's the address for Allen.com? And it gives us the address. It don't really work that way. The real breakdown for it is when we use DNS64, basically, he queries the, the quad A record. If you know what a quad A record is, right? A quad A record is basically a domain name mapping for an IPv6 host. So like if we're trying to reach an, IPv, an IPv6 host, we ask for its quad A record, right? But if we're trying to ask for a IPv4 host and we ask for its domain name, like say google.com and we ask for its IPv4 host, we are querying for its A record, not its quad A record. It's just its single A record. So just A is for IPv4. AAAA is for IPv6. So since we're trying to reach quad A record, Right, because we're trying to look for an IPv6 device. He was say, "Hey, what's the quad A record for this website?" Right? He's gonna say, "Hey, what's your quad A record?" This is IPv4 host. He's gonna say, "I don't have a quad A record. I'm an IPv4 host." That's basically what happens here. And then the DNS 64 server is gonna be, or 64 uh, server is gonna be like, "Well, I know he's since he's an IPv4 host. Let me ask him for his single A record." And that's what happens right here. Well, what then? What's your single A record in? You go, oh, well, my IPv4 record, my IPv4 address is 192.0.33. And then he, and then the DNS 64 server lets the IPv6 host know what it is. And then he goes, okay, that by the way, this address that we were talking about, 64ff9b, that is called a pref64 address. If you want to remember that as well, that's called a pref64 prefix rather. So he says, okay, then he, he knows the full address for this record is going to be the pref64 or 64 ff 9 b colon colon. And then the suffix will be the IPv4 address. So now he has a full address for this IPv4 host, even though he only speaks in IPv6. That's what happens when he queries. That's really what happens when he queries that DNS server. He don't just say, hey, what's the uh, IPv6 address? And he tells him, no, he actually gets an empty of response because he don't know it. He don't have a quad A record. He has a single A record because he's IPv4. So let's talk about the difference between stateless and stateful NAT64. Stateless provides a one-to-one -one mapping, right? So when we did, when we were finally able to get this, he goes, okay, well, I know that this address is, you know, what he's going to take this address and map it to whatever the host name is, or the domain name is. So let's say that this is, I don't know, uh, footlocker.com or something, right? He knows that this address is equal to footlocker.com. That's the one-to-one -one mapping for that, right? So this will be considered a stateless NAT64 uh, mapping, right? There's no bindings or session states that are maintained. So he's not going to remember all of that. He's not going to keep all of that, right? That's why it's not recommended. It's not very scalable. And, you know, you're going to have to have all of these mappings, uh, IPv4 and IPv6 mappings, keep a record of that. But stateless obviously does not keep a record of that. Um, and it's not very intuitive because if you have a whole bunch of IPv6 mappings that you need to keep um, uh, maintained, which they really don't, it'll just 
it, it'll just be too much for you to keep up with. And uh, IPv4 address of the destination is embedded in the IPv6 address, which is basically what we did right here. So that's the IPv6 prefix. And then that's the um, IPv4 address right there. It's like basically we put it together. And also be, be advised that this is a slash 96 because IPv4 addresses are 32 bit. IPv6 are 128 bit. So it leaves us with a slash 96 to play with as far as the uh, the prefix goes. That's stateless, right? So stateful provides one to many IP address mapping. So we can have one mapping to many other IP addresses, right? It maintains a table of bindings. That's the difference between stateful and stateless. That's almost the same thing as firewalls, right? With state, stateful and stateless uh, addresses. One keeps a record, one doesn't. That's basically the main difference. It's scalable because it allows us to keep all the records and it's a one-to-many mapping, right? It allows for dynamic bindings. However, this is a con right here. Unable to route VRF and multicast traffic. So it is not very intuitive as far as that goes. And that's basically NAT64. Now, NPT version 6, that is network prefix translation. It's not used very often. And that's another reason why I skipped it in the earlier. I believe we talked about this early when I first started this channel. It's used to simply translate one IPv6 prefix to another. Unlike NAT, it can do... It cannot do any type of overloading. You remember what overloading is, right? That's basically when you have when you add the port number to a IP address and use that as your dynamic um, natting, basically. NPT, or it's basically port address translation. That's basically what that is. NPT version 6 allows one-to-one -one translation and only the prefix is replaced. This is usually done on the internet edge of networks. So if you look at this right here, that's like if you have any like like dual NIC cards or something like that, or you have a dual homed, like if you have two ISPs, one could be your primary link, one is your backup link, right? Well, you can have two different prefixes for both of them, right? As you can see here, we have this is our prefix, right? That's the inside prefix. When we get out to the internet, a different prefix, but they're the same on both ways. When we go this way, that is going to be translated to this. We go to this way, that's going to be translated to the same address, right? So that's basically what NPT is right there. As you can see here, NPT version 6 cannot operate if NAT64 is on the same interface. So it's not really compatible with each other, NAT64 and NPT version 6. These are just two ways that we can use network address translation with IBV6. That's just two different ways is all it is. It also does not support VRF and multicast traffic. However, it is useful in that it does not rewrite any higher level information, just the IP header. So yeah, basically we're just translating this address, the prefix though, not the, because remember the, the suffix, the number at the end will be the actual IP address of the other device or the other, you know, whatever we're trying to reach. That will most likely be the suffix of the other location that we're trying to reach. So that is all I got for y'all today. I know we're not going to do any hands on today because as you can tell, it said to only to just describe if you remember, that's what it said on the bullet point. I guess I forgot to point that out. We're just describing what at 64 and NPT 64 is. For now, go ahead and add me on Twitter. That is my YouTube page right there. Leave a comment below. Please share these videos. Thank you for watching the network.